will take any hot shoe flash that you already have. And normally with these, you have a knob you have to loosen, turn it, tighten it back up. With this, all you do is give a little depress to that trigger, and you can articulate it any way you want. It goes almost all the way back to almost all the way forward. Um, it doesn't go further than that because the box and the flashes start getting stale. So there's that there, and it's designed to take our mag ring. Just slides in here. Twist to lock it in place, and then any speed light um, that you might already have a macro on or that you add one to, yeah. fit in there. The magnets hold it in place. Would you need the mag? Would you need the macro anyway? Would that if you did? Yeah. So there's not enough uh, leverage yeah, there, on that. To there would be it. nothing. So if I were to take this off, it doesn't uh, stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, uh, right. yeah, there's nothing going on too. So. And then our mag box. Is this is the collapse form? It comes right out of the case here. To open it, just give it a press. And then, because everything else is magnetic, we can magnets on that as well. Right. So it attaches just like that. Same thing with the diffuser. Normally, they've always been Velcro, so it's kind of a pain. But we do the same thing with magnets on here. Just get one in place. You can hear them kind of clicking. concerned insects and I feel that they're very underrepresented in the world and I've, I've learned to love insects um, and in fact my wife has had to as well because we have quite a few living with us. If you're interested later today at 2.30 at stand F65 which is the wildlife worldwide stand I'm going to be demonstrating some of the macro techniques we're about to look at here. All of these creatures are species that live in the UK. This could be one of the monsters from that film Tremors. It, it's a tiger beetle larva that lives in sand burrows um, just on the coast near Liverpool. This is a poplar hawk moth which came to my garden a few years ago and if you look at the detail in that you might notice there's a lot of depth of field and that's done with focus stacking which is something we're going to talk about a little later. Now I know invertebrates can get a bad reputation. I'm sure we've all been bitten by things in the past. 
but sometimes you must suffer for your art. So next time you're bitten by a horsefly, why not make the most of the opportunity? Um, this little fellow was just sitting on my knuckle, and if you want to get the blood coming back up the proboscis like that, just give your hand a really good squeeze, and eventually his eyes will pop out. No, not really. Um, but interestingly, images of parasites on humans are used quite widely in the media. So if I was to photograph a beautiful butterfly, I might nail the picture, but that picture for me isn't necessarily going to help me pay the gas bill, which is what I have to do with my work. Whereas if I get a picture of a mosquito or maybe this horse fly biting me, um, unfortunately for me, that image is going to be a lot more popular. So I've got quite a history of parasite pictures. This is a little jumping spider. Now, some of you may have seen jumping spiders in your gardens over the past few years. Um, we're probably familiar with the zebra spiders, which are little black and white spiders about so big, they hop around on the fence posts. And do you see those massive eyes they've got? So they're ambush predators, they're, they're spotting movement and jumping onto the back of their prey. And so, just like when you're photographing big animals, if we can get down to eye level with our subject, if we can get those eyes in focus, we get a real connection with the subject. All of these spiders are British. So look at the diversity we've got there. They're all to scale relative to one another. That biggest one is the fen raft spider. She's our heaviest spider. You can see this one's a house spider, so you've all seen those in the bath before now, I'm sure. You can see the, the volume of this thing. It's a real beast, isn't it? But it can actually walk on water, so quite dainty. And then you go down to some of the smaller ones that are like jewels, that little green cucumber spider there, or the yellow crab spider, that can actually change colour to match the flowers it's on. But I'd like to talk about the range of options we have as photographers in this day and age to get up close to invertebrates. I didn't use a macro lens for this. Anybody want to guess what, what focal length was I at? What lens was I using here? I think I heard, yeah, a fisheye lens, okay? So a fisheye lens can get you about that close to your subject and allow you to get a lot of context in as well. So with a macro lens, you tend to end up with a shallow depth of field, even if you're using f22, and your background, unless it's very immediate, is going to be blurred. So you don't see that environment in your picture. Um, just in case you've missed it, we do have a large moth on this tree trunk here. Similarly, with this little poison frog, this was in the Peruvian rainforest. It's only about a centimetre long, but we've got this great sense of the rainforest around it. Now, a little tip for you, if you want to use a fisheye lens to do close-up photography, I use a 15mm fisheye and I also put a 1.4 teleconverter on it. That actually turns it into a 21mm fisheye, which stops it being such a ridiculous sort of goldfish bowl appearance and lets you get a little bit more magnification for these tiny creatures. I found that I shoot Canon. The Canon's own teleconverter doesn't actually mate with the Canon 8 to 15mm fisheye. I use a third party one, which doesn't have the bit protruding out of the back, made by Kenko. So, you remember that giant fat raft spider we saw earlier? Here she is in her context. Kind of interesting to compare the two styles. So, I do a lot of white background photography to illustrate you know, all the anatomical details in a creature, but it's this sort of thing that really gets me going. And we were very, very close to this subject when we photographed it. A day at the seaside. I'm sure we all still love rock crawling, really. We just don't get enough time to do it. I must say, if you like macro photography, a trip down to the rock pools will be very, very productive for you. All of those sea anemones, um, all of the little patterns with the shells, and even the sand I've spent time photographing before. And last one of this concept of these fisheye shots to show context. This is a scaly cricket. It's a very rare species of cricket in the UK. 
I was shooting an article with um, a chap who was writing a piece about where these lived on Chesil Beach, and he said, Alex, I need a picture of the cricket and all of Chesil Beach in it. And he said, no problem, I thought, until I got there, and, and you know, the scales were so different, and it was only with this fisheye lens that that was possible. So here's the very beginning. This is this little black dot in the middle of frog spawn, which is quite mind-blowing, really. We're actually seeing cell cleavage there. We're seeing the cells dividing, and we can do that with our SLR. You know, we live in such an exciting era to be a wildlife photographer. Um, even 20 years ago, a lot of these things just wouldn't have been available to us. You'd have had to spend tens of thousands of pounds to get anything like this. I took this picture in a cereal bowl on my dining room table. Um, I did take the cornflakes out first, but safe to say this little, little packet of life was then returned to my pond afterwards. And the ethics of all this matter, I'm sure to you, as much as they do to me, they may be little creatures, but their lives matter just as much as the big ones. Very subtle different shades of browns and greens. This is looking down on the top of frog spawn. So I did this with a tripod and just a little word on tripods and macro. The legs on this tripod can go pretty much flat and there's no centre column. So I can get it right down to ground level. That really helps. And if you're interested, I use a large ball head so I can just control the camera position very quickly. This is a montage that I've done. So I've got a little Petri dish, a little glass dish, and I've photographed these three stages of it's a baby toad developing. Um, and I've backlit it with a flash gun. So I've done this all next to the pond. So you can, you can work in a little mini field studio when you do macro. And I like to do that, so I'll take my equipment out into the field to get some different effects, to get some different shots with my creatures. I often work on microscope slides, because of course life just seems to get more amazing the closer in you go. So this is about life in the drop of pond water. And you can see there's lots going on in there. This is called Volvox. Um, it's a little chlorophyte alga. It's about half a millimetre across each of those green spheres. These are hydra. This is about a one centimetre section of the underside of a lily pad. Um, this was found in my garden in April, when it looks really unpromising for your macro photography, I can assure you. But there's ever so much going on in your pond. If you're wondering how I did this, I made a little aquarium out of microscope slides. I used a tiny little bead of silicon sealant, I made a mini mini aquarium and then floated this little section of lily pad in that aquarium so I could shoot from the side. So here I am at work and I think slightly sunburnt there, that will have been the Austrian Alps in the summer. What is going on under here? Well, let me, uh, let me explain. This is an off-camera flash with a diffuser on it. And the idea of this is that your flash gun has a fairly small front area to it, so the light coming out of that will be quite hard. If we put a diffuser on, we've increased the surface area of that flash, and so the light can better wrap around your subject, so long as you've got it nice and close to illuminate it, and that gets rid of hard edge shadows, and the light can actually start to look natural. In fact, when you do flash really well, I like to think you shouldn't really be able to tell if it was done with flash, or maybe just sunlight. So I've got, there's a little spider right under there on this rock, and you can see how close I've got that flash gun to get the soft light. I sometimes um, use the flash when I'm on a tripod as well. And here we've got a little card to reflect the light back into the shot. So I thought that would be interesting for you to see how I actually work, you know, what setup I'm actually using there. And here is the spider that I photographed earlier in that shot before. That's the image you can get. You can see the diffuser has lit up the background as evenly as it has the subject. That whole area 
underneath that diffuser is being illuminated evenly. That's your little workstage. And any creature in there is going to be exposed nicely. So why have I put this in? Well, it's because messy gardens are good for invertebrates, so that's my excuse anyway. This is our back garden. Jen would be horrified if she knew I was showing this to you, but there we go. And propped up against the wall is my tripod. So sometimes you just have to get that tripod into a tight spot. And I'm working here with house spiders. And here's a very average record shot of it. You know, okay, it's in focus. I've used F16 to get some good detail, but have a look at what we can do with one off-camera flash to backlight it. Same spider, we've transformed that scene. It's got thin legs, it's got hairy legs, rather like some of us, I'd imagine. And if you're going to flash behind those, you'll see all of the little details showing up. So, it's a technique I use an awful lot. Same with this jellyfish. That wasn't done in my garden, but it was done in um, Tobermory Harbour on the Isle of Mull. I have a little Pyrex dish that lives in my car boot and I just scoop this jellyfish, it's only about the size of a 50 pence, out of the harbour and I put one flash on the ground below it, just out of frame, and that has backlit it. Um, the reason that the background is black is there's a little piece of black velvet on the ground below. I have done some Photoshop here, I painted some black over the word Pyrex because it detracted somewhat. I hope you forgive me. Such simple subjects make wonderful pictures. So, a cobweb, one off-camera flash. This one's not even diffused. I can hold the flash in one hand, the camera in the other. And what I'm doing here is I'm exposing for the flash. So, the camera's in manual mode, the flash is in manual mode. I'd usually have the flash on maybe about half power. And I'm adjusting the manual settings in my camera so that the daylight becomes so underexposed that it doesn't even show up. So the sunlight is coming out as black, the flash is actually a lot brighter than the sun when this is at half power, and so by fiddling around with my manual settings I can exclude all sunlight and just see the flash. This gives us a, a black canvas on which we paint with this light, and that's so exciting you don't have to accept what you see first off when you're wandering around. Here's a caterpillar from the Peruvian rainforest. So there was a very busy background behind that, but we haven't pointed the flash at it. I've <coughs> exposed for the flash rather than the daylight, so the background just doesn't show up. I know this is called the Great Outdoors Stage. Is this pass? This is afternoon tea at Cork Abbey. Just to show you that you shouldn't leave that camera behind. Um, you see I've got the flash in one hand. It's illuminating wasps landing on this little jar here. Hey guys, so today I went to the photography show at the NEC and I'm so tired. Like, I only had four hours sleep um, last night because I was up editing for my video that came out today. Um, so I'm super tired. And then I was walking around from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. But it was amazing. Like, I saw so much stuff. Like, I got persuaded to buy two new cameras. I haven't bought them yet because I'm back there again tomorrow. So tomorrow I'm gonna be trading in my Sony A5100 for the Canon M50. Um, it's a more up-to-date vlogging camera and it takes really good photos as well. And um, my Sony keeps overheating, so that's starting to become a real problem and it's really annoying me. So I decided that I would go for an upgrade. It's just got so many good features to it. So, um, yeah, I'm going to trade in my camera there tomorrow, and then I'm going to be getting the M50, which I'm super excited about. And then I tried out a bunch of the DSLR Canon cameras, mainly the Canon 5D Mark IV, I think it was. Um, it's like the new, it's the newest one of the 5Ds, and it was shooting so well, I 
really want it. Um, but I decided that being as I'm just getting into like wedding photography and photo shoots, I thought that I would go for the Mark III rather than the Mark IV because there's if I buy the Mark III used, I can get it for about £1,200 less. So I thought, considering I'm starting out, I don't really need the top of the top. Like, So um, I thought that'd still be a pretty good camera. So I'm going to go for that one. But yeah, I'm super excited. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. I can't remember. Oh, and I went to a Lindsay Adler workshop today which was amazing she's a fashion photographer she's american and she gave so much good advice she told us all about her tips her tricks like everything and um there were so many useful things in that presentation and she spoke for an hour and um she showed us her work at the beginning when she started and her work now her vision um ways of figuring out your niche and what you're trying to achieve and ways of like enjoying your photography for as long as possible so she was telling us about this project that she did which sort of inspired me to do my own project and she was saying that it's quite good to do projects on the side of your photography because if you do it for work or as a hobby you will see the same type of photography so she was saying like if you do weddings or if you do portraits or if you do like wildlife she was saying maybe do a project on something different and then you'll get a bit of experience and a bit of fun out of doing something like not what you'd usually do she did a project to do with the color red and she said that she thought about all the ways that she could shoot a theme around the color red so she did fabric clothing hair makeup backdrops um all that kind of stuff and she came up with some really good ideas and she did a series of photos so i kind of decided that i would do a series of photos and do my own theme so i think that i'm gonna go for sunflowers um sunflowers are my favorite i've got a tattoo of a sunflower on my arm and so the way I'm going to do it is I thought I can use real sunflowers, I can use sunflower patterns on clothing because I'm starting to make my own clothes so I thought I could make something for a photo shoot for someone to wear. Um, then I had a cool idea to do sunflower earrings and then do a makeup shoot and then have them as like a focal point if they're quite large. And I'm also going to do a photo shoot in a sunflower field if I can find one near where I live I'm hoping that I can I know there's lavender fields nearby but that's not what we're going for so um yeah I thought it'd be quite cool to go to somewhere that's got sunflowers um yeah so I'm going to try and come up with some ideas and it's all to do with like my favorite color yellow so it kind of resonates with me quite a lot so yeah I'm gonna do a project on sunflowers so if you follow me on my instagram you'll see the photos from it i might make a video on it it just depends like what i'm doing whether i vlog any of it so um yeah so make sure you follow me on my instagram and then you'll see my sunflower project as it goes on because i'm quite excited about it i'm hoping that i get somewhere with it and it doesn't just like fall flat or i run out of ideas or so fingers crossed but um yeah i think i'm gonna go to bed because i'm literally falling asleep i'm gonna have a shower i think first but it's like half eight and i'm falling asleep i'm watching youtube videos and i'm like i can't stay awake so yeah and then i'm gonna get up early tomorrow and then i think i'm gonna walk to the nec because it's like half an hour away from where i'm staying and then i will be at the second day which is just crazy and I checked the lineup and James Popsis is there and there's loads of YouTube talks Instagram talks and I thought that's exactly what I need like, I want to learn about how to keep your YouTube and Instagram followers engaged and how to create that content and 
any tips and things like that so yeah I'm definitely going to be loving tomorrow because it looks like a really good day I've done most of the haul I did most of it today so it means I can kind of focus on all of the talks tomorrow because I watched a few of the talks and demos and practice shoots and things but um, I didn't go to as many as I wanted to but I think most of the ones that focus on me are tomorrow so that works quite well so um, yeah and then afterwards I'll be getting the train home but I will see you tomorrow <laughs>
and we try and create a little bit more of a flattering light, less kind of contrasty, less harsh. And all we've done is we've hardly moved it at all. Alex only moved it, what, a couple of steps, if that. So same setup, same settings, but we're going to take another shot and to see how that compares. And what we could also do as well is just bring, bring it down a little bit, just so we lighten a little bit more of the bottom half. James, can you flip your legs the other way? That's it, yeah. And then can you face this way for me? That's it. That's it, you take a mental note and then compare it with this one. Again, just one light, same light. Almost feels like maybe it's a different modifier. So this is why this is my go-to. It's brilliant, I love using this. And another reason I love to use the dual peaker bracket in particular, and not maybe a uh, City 400, which has just recently come out. The reason why I love to use this system over the 400 is because you can turn this uh, this light into two lights. You can go from one light, you can go from one light to two lights. So we only did this a couple of times in Ethiopia, but the way we did it was, um, I would say to Alex, Alex, can we remove one of the peakers? And then already in Alex's pocket, or it could be in your pocket, he's already got this speed light adapter here that attaches straight on. He's already got a MagMod holder ready to go. And also in his pocket are some gels, so he keeps them on him all the time. And then what we can do before we get to that though, is Alex will then take the second light, go behind our subject, switch the group from A to B so that now I, now I can control it independently. And instantly we've gone from one light to two lights. Okay, so definitely see it that time. So let me just bring down the power again. And once more. Great, thank you Jane. Okay, let's wait for that to pop in. Okay. A little bit over for my liking, but you get the idea. So that, how cool is that? You can go from one light to two lights so quickly, and then just add even more of an element to it. Alex can now put a grid on it, he can put a gel on it, just to add a bit of separation, not only with light, but now also with some color. So let's start, Alex, with the... Oh, my bad, did I take it off yet? <laughs> What's also great about having someone like Alex as your voice activated light stand is his tall tones. Alright, so now we've got a, a grid and we've also got a, a half CTO gel. Now straight away I know that that's going to cut out some of the light, so I'm just really going to increase that output, but I'm just going to guess it because we don't have a light meter, but I know it's going to need to go up, but let's we'll see how we get on. Okay, Jane? Okay, wait for that to pop in, take a mental note. And there we go, we've got a little bit of colour, just a tiny bit of separation there. We could use a full CTO gel. It's a little bit too obvious for me though, so I much prefer to use a half CTO gel. That's kind of my go-to. So you can see the, the flexibility you can have going from one light to two lights, and then when we're done, Alex can then just take that off, put it back in his pocket, put the other peaker back on, and then we're good to go again. But let's just say you want to use this setup for maybe corporate headshots, which is easy, and you can easily do. And something that I always carry with me as well is a reflector, especially if I'm getting on the train to London and I need to grab everything in one go. And we are actually selling on the Pixpro stand at E91 all of this as a kit, uh, barring the background, obviously, and, and Jane and the chair. We've got, uh, it's my signature travel kit. Uh, the only difference is the reflector will be a little bit smaller. It'll be one of the traditional round ones, but this was um, uh, all that they have in the stand because they've already sold out.